God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, this is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings on this Sunday, June the 28th, 2020, from the historic St. John African Methodist Episcopal Church, located on the corner of East 40th Street and Central Avenue here in Cleveland, Ohio, where I, the Reverend Henry M. Curtis, before and serve as senior pastor. We thank you for inviting us into your homes this morning as we worship God. Scripture says God is spirit, and those who worship God must do so in spirit and in truth. So wherever you are, we ask that you would just join us as we come together in worship and proclaim our love for the Lord. That's why the songwriter said, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, from the bottom of my heart. Went on to say, I praise your name. I praise your name. I praise your name from the bottom of my heart. He says, I worship you. I worship you from the bottom of my heart. So if you love the Lord, please join us wherever you are in singing. I love you, Lord. I love God for this service of worship and as we begin let us do so in the traditional African Methodist Episcopal Church call to worship I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord our feet shall stand within thy gates O Jerusalem for they and thy Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Lord, in the house of the Lord, shall flourish in the courts of our God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Lord, I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelleth. For the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done a marvelous thing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth sing praise. Amen. Our morning prayer will be rendered by the Reverend Delyn P. Harrison, who will also read our gospel lesson. Mm -hmm. go to the Lord and pray. Oh, how excellent is your name in all the earth. The God of our creation, the Alpha and the Omega. How awesome you are, Father God. We just thank and praise you 
for last night's slumber. We praise and we thank you for us getting upright this morning. And we thank and praise you for allowing us to come into worship one more time, Father God. Because it did not have to be. Father God, we are grieved by the deaths of our sisters and our brothers who did not make it on today, who did not make it through the week, who have not made it through this pandemic. Our souls grieve for them, Father God, but we know that weeping may come for one night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. And we know, Father God, that you will be with us, just as you are with us through every uncertainty, every uncertainty of our country, every uncertainty of the racial unrest, every uncertainty of our voting privileges, every uncertainty of whether or not we will test positive on tomorrow. But Father God, we know through it all you are with us, and we thank you. Now, Father God, we just ask that you continue to be with us in this worship service. Wherever your sanctuary is today, we just know that the Lord will be there with you so that you can worship him in spirit and in truth. And Father God, we pray for our musician this morning. We pray for our soloist this morning. We pray for our pastor who will bring forth the word on this morning. And we pray for you. So Father God is saying to me this morning that listen, listen to the Lord who created you, O Israel. The one who formed you says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. And when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. And when you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt his ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Seba in your place, and others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours, because you are precious to me. You are honored, and I love you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. lesson this morning is coming from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 37 through 42. <coughs> he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet because he is a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. 
And he who receives a righteous man, because he is a righteous man, shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. God's word for God's people. Now we will have a musical selection by Sister Sharita Sullivan. Amen.
church say amen. Amen. Amen, amen again. Amen. amen for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Sister Sullivan, Sister Richardson, Brother Bearden, for that beautiful selection. It says, you don't know the cost of my oil, and you don't know the cost of my praise. Folks don't know the cost of what it takes to, to get up sometimes and to come here on Sunday morning. And some people don't understand why we get excited when we come into the house of the Lord, because they don't know what it took to get here. Have I got a witness? So if you're glad to just be here today, somebody ought to just say amen. 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 It is a blessing once again to, to be with you and thank you for welcoming us into your homes and wherever you are and for being with us. And as I've said every week, unfortunately in this virtual space we're unable to greet each other as we would with hugs and kisses and, and words of of comfort. So those of you on the live feed, please uh, say hello to us and say hello to one another and let us know where you are and, and that you are with us this morning. And we certainly thank you uh, for your encouragement and for all of the fine things that uh, you're doing in the community and that ministry is still going forth in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to turn your attention to our gospel lesson Read for your hearing by Reverend Harrison from Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 42. And while we will examine the entirety of the text, I ask that you would pay particularly close attention to verse 42. And Jesus said, And whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple. Truly, I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. I'd like for you to think with me and pray with me this morning on the theme relevant to our subject matter, small gesture, big difference. Small gesture, big difference. Let us pray. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thine erring children lost and lone. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. amen. This past week I was captivated by a story that I read online. And it came out of the state of Missouri that there is an 11-year-old boy who started earning his own money by cutting his neighbor's lawns. But inspired by the events that have taken place in the nation over the last several weeks, this young man, 11 years old, named Jack Powers, started using the money that he earned cutting grass, not for himself, but for donating to Black Lives Matter. Here you have a white sixth grader in the state of Missouri, which once had codified in his laws that black people were three-fifths of a man, raising money cutting grass in solidarity for the movement to end racial injust injustice and oppression. The report said, and I quote, that Jack said, when I saw what happened to George Floyd and saw how people were being treated, I decided to make a change. The small gesture of an 11-year-old boy cutting grass can make a big difference in being a change because at the age of 11, presumably he has generations to live and if more people have that mentality, then we'll stop seeing what we've been seeing. It took courage for him to make a change and it takes courage for us to stand with persons who are oppressed Courage to stand with those who are victimized by systems that set them up to fail. It takes courage to reach out to the least, the lost, and the left behind. And yet, as Jesus' followers, 
That's exactly what each of us, by virtue of our baptism, is called to do. Look at the text in verses 37 through 39. Jesus says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross to follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Here, Jesus promises a reward, and he promises this reward, but it also carries reminders that the vocation of discipleship is risky business. If you are, as they say, a scaredy cat, don't come into ministry. It's not for the faint of heart. Jesus is saying that if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my follower, don't look for a life of comfort and ease. It's going to be a difficult journey. But don't be discouraged because in that journey, I'm going to walk with you each and every step of the way. I'm never going to leave you, nor am I going to forsake you. And let me help somebody this morning. Those whom God calls, God also equips. Have I got a witness? So Jesus gives this promise of reward, but he also warns them of the risk of the work that they've signed up to do. His disciples are counted among the prophets and the righteous. However, their fate is linked with opposition, suffering, and death. So hearing that, the question has to come up in people's minds, why would anyone ever sign up for this job? Because following Jesus is not an easy task. It's not the glitz and it's not the glamour that we see with quote-unquote successful televangelists who travel around the world in private jets and fill arenas with thousands of people. If you want to be rich and famous, ministry is not the place for you to be. Have I got a witness? No, Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be called by my name, if you're going to do my work and work with me and work for me and work in me, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your life. That's why the songwriter said, I surrender all. Not I surrender some, not I surrender what I want to surrender, but says all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. Jesus says, if you're going to come and follow me, it's going to cost you all that you have. And that's not a message that we want to hear. That's not the work that most people wish to do. And yet to this day, people are still doing the work of ministry in Jesus' name. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. See, in the midst of opposition to religious institutions, in our increasingly secular society, people are still doing ministry in Jesus' name. I've come here today to tell you that even though it's a difficult journey, even though it's not glitzy and glamorous, people are still feeding the hungry, people are still clothing the naked, people are still housing the homeless, people are still educating the children, people are still, still looking after the widow, people are still caring after the sick, people are still comforting the lonely, people are still advocating for the oppressed, all of these things and more they do on a 24-7 basis because they love Jesus. I can remember one time serving in a program when I was in college and the director of the program was having a difficult time leading it. And I remember her telling me, said if I was actually getting paid for this, I would have quit a long time ago. See, there's some things that have to be bigger to you than a paycheck, amen? That you do it because you know the price that God paid in giving his son Jesus for us on Calvary and there's no amount of money in the world no amount of silver, no amount of gold that would turn you around from doing what God has called you to do see that's Jesus' command 
to his disciples that they be fully engaged in following him and in doing the work that he's called them to do. See, Jesus' disciples are counted amongst the most vulnerable members of the community. He refers to them as the quote-unquote little ones for whom a cup of cold water is a gift. Jesus says in verses 40 through 42, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet because he is a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Here, church, Jesus affirms the relationship between disciples, himself, and the Father. And then the certainty of the reward due to those who welcome prophets, the righteous, and the little ones. Now, it's important, church, to understand the historical context in which Jesus spoke these words. For in the Jewish tradition in which Jesus and his early disciples lived, emissaries represented the functional presence and bore the full responsibility and authority of the one who sent them. In other words, Jesus' disciples represent the full presence and power of Jesus. And Jesus himself bears the full presence and power of God. That's a major theme in Matthew's gospel. And we also see other examples of this because I think to the gospel of John when, when they said to Jesus, well, well, show us the Father and, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, when you're talking to me, you're talking to the Father. And when I send you out, when you're received, they're receiving me. So as representatives of Christ, when we go out, we're the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the mouths of Jesus. The only gospel some people will ever see is us. The only Bible that they'll ever read is, is us. The only way to Jesus they will see is through our lives and through our witness and when they receive us he says we they receive him so Jesus's teaching makes clear that God's power is now at work not only in Jesus but in and through his disciples now that can be unsettling that the Lord's not only working through Jesus but he's working through you and through me that's a lot of pressure, but with that pressure, somebody ought to say hallelujah, there's God's grace. Because we couldn't handle it on our own, but we handle it because God's grace is with us. We handle it because the anointing of the Holy Ghost is upon us. We don't go out and minister in and to ourselves and in our name, but we've got to minister in Jesus' name. So when they receive us, they're receiving him. And this is where the rubber meets the road and where we can apply this text and this teaching in our lives. Because it's important to understand that Jesus is all about relationships. Somebody say relationships. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus reiterates his relationship with and his relationship to the Father. We also see Jesus relating with and relating to the Holy Ghost. We see Jesus relating to men and women from all walks of life, which was not common, nor was it socially acceptable in Jesus' day. There was no way, according to the righteous Jews of Jesus' time, should he have even called Zacchaeus out of the sycamore tree. There was no way 
that a single man like Jesus would stop by Mary and Martha's house in Bethany and spend time with them in Jesus' day. There was no way that the woman in the alabaster box would have poured out that oil and even touched the feet of Jesus. But we see Jesus is all about relationships. He relates to you and to me because he's first related to the Father and the Holy Ghost. And I submit to you today that many of our relationships would be better if we can first relate to God. Amen, Pastor Curtis. So throughout the Gospels, he reinforces these relationships. But here, Jesus is saying something that's quite profound. He says that when persons decide to follow him, many of the familiar relationships that bring us comfort and security will change. In other words, I hear Jesus saying to us, when you come follow me, father and mother, son and daughter may turn against you. Friends that you thought you had won't like you anymore. But you can't love your human relationships more than you love me. See, Jesus lets us know as his disciples that our relationship with him transcends any relationship we have with anybody else. And because of this relationship with Jesus, we are grafted in the tradition of the prophets who prophesy and who preach to the righteous and who minister to the little ones. See, the identification of the little ones in the text is no small detail. These folks are on the bottom rung of the social ladder. They're in need of a cup of cold water. And here, Jesus elevates these least powerful members of the community into a position of equal in importance to that of the prophets and the righteous ones. Look at what Eugene Peterson says in the message translation of verse 42. The message renders verse 42 thusly. Give a cool cup of water to someone who is thirsty. For instance, the smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. See the disciples' vulnerability in putting themselves out there for others and their dependence on Jesus is the key to the success of their mission. They can't play it safe if they are in fact followers of Jesus Christ. So much so that a seemingly insignificant act of giving a needy person a cup of cold water has a great impact on the building of the kingdom of God. See, in the wake of the decades-long struggle, between the black community and local police forces. A group has emerged over recent years called Black Lives Matter. And while we can debate the structure and the philosophy of the actual organization that bears that name, the sentence alone, in my mind, speaks to this text. You may hear that and say, well, Pastor Curtis, how is that? Well, Black Lives Matter, not as an organization, but as a sentence, and as an ideal, stands in opposition to those whose philosophy, theology, and actions have long said that black lives don't matter. So what I'm saying is, either black lives matter to you, or black lives don't matter to you. Either you stand for equality as it relates to all human beings created in God's image, or you don't. Either you love your neighbor as yourself, or you don't. Denying an opportunity to be a blessing to someone, especially if he or she lives on the margins of society, is sin in Jesus' eyes. That even the seemingly small act of handing out a cup of cold water to bless comfort and relieve someone who is thirsty says to that person you matter to me yes we have we know that all lives matter but in a society that says black lives don't matter somebody ought to say black lives do matter because either they do 
or they don't. Amen, Pastor Kurtz. I thought about this because I remember back to when I was 10 years old and we traveled down to Luverne, Alabama in Crenshaw County where my great grandparents, Henry F. Curtis Sr. and Pearl F. Curtis live. And for those of you who know Alabama, Crenshaw County is way down in the southern part of the state as you head toward the Florida Panhandle and Luverne is a dot on the map about 50 miles south of Montgomery. Not only are you in Alabama, but you're deep down in Alabama. And I remember we went out to breakfast and it was a crowded restaurant and you got your tray and you found a table and there were no open tables. And as a 10 year old child down in Alabama, even at the age of 10, I was aware of some of the history and I, I knew that it was different down south than it is up south. Some of you will know that joke when I tell you. And there was an old black man that got his tray and he had a baseball cap on and he looked around the restaurant for a place to sit and there was no seating available. And I saw an old white gentleman sitting at a table with a baseball cap on his head and he was at the booth all by himself. And he looked up and he saw the dilemma of the elderly black gentleman looking for a table and I remember him looking at him and motioning for him to come and to sit with him. And I was mesmerized at the age of 10 down in southern Alabama, the place that had been the, 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 the battleground for the civil rights movement. And even though I was 10 and didn't understand all of it, I knew enough to know that what I was witnessing was something unusual and something special. And I saw an old, and I'm not trying to be offensive to anyone who's elderly, but you have to understand, it's important that there was an old white man and an old black man Two men that had been raised in an era where they never should have known each other, never should have spoken to each other, could not worship in the same church together, could not work together, could not go to school together. And yet I saw this old white gentleman motion to an old white man to sit down and eat with him. And now, many decades later, I'm still reminded that even at the micro level, even at the individual level, that God can cause us to transcend all of the barriers Amen. that society would put in our way. That it was a small gesture, but it made a big difference that this man was able to sit down and eat. That despite their differences, that despite their history, that despite their society, despite their, their culture, that they could sit down and somebody could say, I am indeed my brother's keeper. And these two men sat at a table in Alabama eating together and breaking bread. See, we often imagine Christian discipleship as requiring huge sacrifice or entailing great feats. But at other times, Jesus simply says, it's nothing more than giving a cup of cold water to one who is in need. You don't have to be a hero or a heroine. Just offer someone a hug who's grieving. Give a listening ear to someone who needs to confide in you. Offer a ride to somebody who doesn't have a car. Volunteer to help a child learn how to read. Give clothes and food to the needy. Prepare a resume for somebody who's on the floor and unemployed. I've come here today to tell you, discipleship does not have to be heroic. It just has to be. I thank God for this text because right underneath me in this pulpit is water, hallelujah. And I thank God for my communion stewardesses who are dutiful in making sure that there's water in the pulpit. They may not know it, but they are absolutely essential to ministry. 
Because I can't be up here parched. I can't be up here dehydrated. That even the act of putting water in the pulpit is a blessing to the preacher. And I pray that the preacher is a blessing to the kingdom of God. You don't have to be a star. You don't have to be a hero. You don't have to have your name in life. You don't have to get all the accolades or the rewards. You don't have to be rich. All you have to do is be faithful to Christ who has called you. And according to Jesus, even a small gesture can make a big difference in somebody else's life. Amen. And if we, as his disciples, keep making these small gestures in his name, Jesus says, we shall not lose our reward. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I pray that that message was a blessing to you today. And while Christ has called us to make small gestures that make big differences in other lives, Jesus did a big thing on Calvary's cross where he suffered, bled, and died for our sins went to the grave and God raised him from the dead with all power in his hand. This crucified and risen Christ speaks to you today and says, come and be my disciple. The road may not always be easy, but I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you accept Christ in your life today, then pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. Live your life in me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Wash away my sins and create in me a clean heart and put a new and right spirit within me. This and all things I ask in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me today, then please send an email to St. John AME Church, C L E V at gmail.com or pick up the phone and call area code 216-431-2560 or write to me at St. John AME Church 2261 East 40th Street Cleveland, Ohio 44103 if you've already accepted Christ in your life but you need a church home a community of faith where you can continue to learn and to continue to grow. We offer St. John to you today. Please contact us and let us know that you want to unite with this body of believers so that we can labor with you in the vineyard. The songwriter said, I have decided to follow Jesus 